This video is brought to you by BoardGamePrices.com. Find the best prices for board games at BoardGamePrices.com. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to 10 games that are great with 5 players. Now a reminder about these lists that they are my opinion and only my opinion. Do not treat them as though they are written in stone and some kind of law that must be enforced. But the idea of this video is to talk about 10 games I think work really well at the 5 player count. This is not necessarily the greatest games ever, but games that excel at that particular player point. In this case, 5 players. For me, 5 players seems to be the ideal point for games where the concept of the enemy of my enemy is my friend comes to the fore. Because there's just enough players to form alliances, but because it's an odd number, you can't form even alliances. Something I'm doing differently for this video is the honorable mentions are not coming from me. They're coming from people on Patreon. So if you want to hear your suggestions in any lists like this, sign up to Patreon. The first honorable mention is Western Legends by Dice Spire. Western Legends goes to six, which I think is awesome too, but five is just right. You have plenty of interaction and yet also room to stay away and do your own thing. Brilliant game. Evan Hardy says, Betrayal at House on the Hill is really ideal at five people. This is because at six people the haunt often happens too quickly, leaving the house almost unexpected explored and five players end up fighting the haunt which means the trader will usually lose at three or four players the house ends up too explored and too easy to outmaneuver the trader five is the best balance of house exploration haunt start and trader versus player dynamic in my experience andrew arneson says moves the best game at five players three is too few because you lose two suits and the captain doesn't get to pick a partner six feels thin there are so few cards in one's hand and so many other players that the number of interesting situations is limited. Four and five are both good, but fives has always seemed more interesting. Francisco Carranza says, Lancaster and Hansa Teutonica are great at five because of all the worker bumping and area majority perks. Robert Konigsberg says, Medici is great at five. With five players, you secretly remove one sixth of the auctionable cards from the deck, which means there's always a risk the product you want won't appear. With six, the whole deck is always in play. And that little bit of chaos introduced by removing a few cards from the deck is just that little bit that pushes it over the top. Richard Canning says, Cosmic Encounter plays better at five than any other player count. It's an odd player count, which means matches will not be even without someone abstaining, but that becomes more common. People don't have too much to remember, but the chaos is still there, and the turns are fast, and the game progresses at its best speed. And finally, Martin Johnson says, Fury of Dracula, mostly because it uses five characters at all times, no matter the player count. I also find it has a lot more interesting moments when the four players work together to find Dracula, only for him to crap himself when they are so close without anyone knowing. All right, those are the honorable mentions on Patreon. If you want to get on one of these videos, you can sign up. And now on to my list of 10 great games at five players. The first game I'm going to call out is a slightly obvious one, and that's Scythe. One of my issues with Scythe is its scalability. When you're playing with three or four players, the map feels very open. And when you're playing with six or seven, it feels really, really tight. Five seems to be the sweet point for me where there's enough to explore and you can get encounter cards, but you are forced into conflict during the course of the game. I found three player games, you can kind of do your own thing and hardly need to see anyone for the whole game. Whereas at seven players, you're lucky to get more than one or two encounter cards throughout the game, let alone get to the factory in time. In fact, one of my criticisms of Scythe as a game is that it feels appropriate at four to five players and increasingly less so as you move out. It's as though the design doesn't really take into account different player counts, even though on the box it says one to five players and seven with the expansion. Five really is that sweet spot where there's enough conflict in the game to keep it interesting, but enough space that you can expand and get started without falling over someone right at the start of the game. Next up is one of the tightest worker placement games ever designed. And by tight, I mean every single decision you make feels tense. And there's a limited amount of spaces on the board. And that game is Crisis. Now, Crisis is also pretty good at four players, but at five, there is so much pressure on those spaces on the board that you can very rarely get exactly what you want and need. And this is a game that punishes you heavily when you stuff up. So you have to go in with a strategy that accommodates the fact that you're going to get blocked out of things constantly throughout the course of the game. Now, I know for some people that would drive them up the wall and that would make them very frustrated with the game but crisis is supposed to be a game like that it's supposed to be a game where you're worried about how well you're doing and whether you're going to get the right resources in time there's meant to be a bit of panic in a game of crisis otherwise it wouldn't be called crisis it'd be called happy business adventures or something else and if you have five players who know what they're doing with this game it can get really tense each other player's placement is a ooh moment where you're like damn can i still do what i want to do during this turn am i completely and utterly stuffed 
what's my priorities here? Like in a lot of other worker placement games, you'll be going, oh, I'll get this thing that gives me three of these resources over the one that gives me two of those resources. In Crisis, because of the opportunity cost in the game, you might just take the two resources one knowing you'll be able to afford it because the consequences of taking the three resource one and not being able to afford it are far, far worse. Anyway, absolutely recommend this one at five players for people who like medium to heavy Euros that require some engine building and a hell of a lot of thinking and watching what the other players are doing. Next up is one of my favorite games of the last year or so, and that's Nemesis. And the reason I like Nemesis at five players is because you can explore the whole ship through the game relatively easily with that player count. But it also means everyone's relatively close. It's quite hard to disappear by yourself and run off to the other side of the ship because someone will always be able to follow you. And the more players in this game, the more likelihood there is that someone's taken a nasty objective. At five players, it's almost certain that someone is out for themselves. And that increases the table talk in the game. It increases the tension in the game and increases the level of panic that you're not just worried about the aliens that are roaming around eating everyone you're worried that steve sitting next to you is going to shiv you and run for the airlock for me nemesis is a refreshing take on the hidden trader game because the choice to be a trader isn't arbitrarily given to someone at the start of the game you're given two hidden objectives and one is normally a mission that encourages you to cooperate with the rest of the members of the crew the other one encourages you to do the absolute opposite but the choice is on you to decide so if you're playing with a group of people who don't actually like hidden trader games you can just opt not to play the secret objectives that cause you to betray people betrayal is an opt-in mechanism in this game and i think that elevates it slightly it means you're not just randomly assigned to be the bad guy you have to choose and i love that about nemesis i really want to play a game at some point where everyone decides to take the trader cards and just see how the hell it plays out Next up is probably the most simple game on the list, and it's High Society. Now, High Society is a very simple auction game where you're trying to get the most points at the end of the game while not having the least amount of money. So you have to spend to get points, but you have to spend wisely and not get suckered into spending far too much too early in the game. The game doesn't last any longer with five players than it does with three or four. Well, not by much, but the bids go up quite a bit. There's more incentive to spend early to make sure you get the good cards, which heightens the possibility that you'll be forced to spend even more not to get the bad ones. This is one of my go-to short to play games these days, especially if I've got five people around. I even played it once with the guys out at a campsite in the middle of nowhere, because it's the kind of portable game you can take in your camping kit. And of course, there's the delicious irony of sitting on the grass outside your tent, playing a game called High Society. So yeah, if you like auctions and you want a good filler game, for five people, definitely consider High Society. Next up is the absolutely rage-inducing Tammany Hall. There's something about pure area control games that bring out terrible behaviors in people, probably more so than war games. Area control games just lead to nasty arguments and tense moments, and Tammany Hall is one of the nastiest games on the market in that regard. The premise is that your various local politicians in 1800s New York trying to find places for immigrants to live and using the fact that you help these immigrants find places to live to earn political favor and the mayoralty of New York. The reason it works best at five is there are four different types of immigrants, Irish, English, German, and Italian. If you have four players, everyone seems to settle down on a home nationality. With five players, that can't happen. There's also the role of the mayor, and they have to give out four subordinate roles to other players. Of course, that means with five players, everyone is getting one of the four roles. And these roles are really powerful and really interesting. At five players, the game is exceedingly tight, and each ward you are contesting becomes a tight contest. There's no easy wins in a five player game. And it also introduces more table talk, where because someone is ahead on points, multiple players can coordinate taking electorates off them. I'm not sure how easy this one is to find these days, but if you are a fan of pure area control games like Al Grande, definitely have a look at Tammany Hall. The next game on the list was the very first game to be added to the Board Game Geek database. And that game is Die Marke, the German game about by-elections in a mixed member proportional system. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, it's a game about political parties trying to win seats, but you can form coalition governments. 
And the reason five is the best player count for this is at three players, it's way too easy for two players to gang up on the other one. At four players, you kind of end up with two coalitions of two parties each. At five players, the alliances have to shift constantly. You can't just rely on the same coalition partner at each election. So through the course of the seven elections in the game, you'll invariably end up making deals with different parties at different electorates. This game is brutally complex though, and the theme is pretty off-putting to an awful lot of people, as it's a pretty serious take on politics. And MMP is not a common political system. There's like Germany, New Zealand, and maybe a few other countries have it. So as far as political systems go, it's a lot less well understood than say, the US presidential election. But it is a great case study on how coalition governments work under MMP, and the deals that need to be made. And despite its complexity and its high buy-in factor, it's still arguably the best politics game out there. Number four is Imperial Assault, but this entry could go for Descent 2nd Edition, 1st Edition, and a heck of a lot of other games where you have one GM and four people playing. But I think Imperial Assault in particular works best at four, because to work at three or two characters, you have to play with some extra rules to balance the characters up. And it really feels like it was designed as a five player game, with one GM and four people playing four different heroes. Imperial Assault is still one of my favourite dungeon crawlers, largely because of the theme, because I'm a big Star Wars fan, but also because the setup time and play time is about right for a dungeon crawler. It's shorter than, say, a game of Gloomhaven, and a lot less setup than a game of Gloomhaven. Five players just feels right for the game. It feels how it was designed and how it was supposed to be played. Of course, the downside with this game, or upside depending on your bank balance, is just how much extra stuff there is available for it. But that said, there's plenty of game in the core box to keep you entertained for quite a while. The third game on my list is the Polish game of queuing, Kaleka. Echoing some of the other games on this list, Kaleka is best at five players because it feels tight and it feels busy at that player count. Because the game is a satirical take on the desperation of queuing in Cold War Poland, the maximum player count gives you the maximum feeling of desperation. When four other players have lined up for a resource ahead of you, you really feel like you're never going to get that thing you need. Also with the high player count, the darkly humorous elements of the game come to the fore, because there's more cards being played, there's more shenanigans, and there's more table talk and banter at five players. The extra players also don't add a huge amount of playtime to the game either. The second game on my list, is my all-time favorite trading game, and that is Chinatown. Again, Chinatown works best at five players because that's its maximum player count. There's more people you can trade with, and there's more room for deals and negotiations to be made. A game of Chinatown at five players is a frantic, hectic experience, with people asking for shops, for different deeds, money flying back and forth, and because there's so much activity, you can actually lose track of who's winning quite easily. You can be so focused on getting the property you want that you overspend on it, and perhaps you might have overlooked another option that was on the other side of the table. Chinatown's not really a game for introverts who don't like lots of noise and lots of haggling, but if you ask someone who thrives on engagement and thrives on interaction with players, five player game of Chinatown will be absolutely awesome. And the final game on my list, one of my all time favorites, and anyone who's watched this channel will probably not be surprised by this one, and it's Battlestar Galactica. And compared to some of the games on this list, my reasons for why Battlestar is best at five are absolutely clear and codified. And that is the way the trader mechanic works at four players was crap when the game came out and the fixes only made it slightly better. It still doesn't work really well at four players. At five players, you have three humans and two Cylons. You have slightly unbalanced teams, but through the course of the game, they feel balanced. At four players, you either use the saboteur or the sympathizer, and neither of those work particularly well. And at six players, you have to use those mechanics again, and that also doesn't work particularly well. You can use a Cylon leader at six, which is cool, but it creates a very different experience to what I would consider the classic five player Battlestar experience. And probably the best, tightest, and most interesting games of Battlestar I've played have been at five players, and have been where one Cylon has revealed, and the other one has stayed hidden for almost the entirety of the game. This allows a revealed Cylon to add cards to challenges, to sow suspicion, and to throw off anyone card counting the cards added to a challenge, and the destiny deck, which is something I do. 
It's just another game that feels like it was designed for five players. And that's where it was tested and that's where it worked best. And the four and six player counts they had to bolt on mechanics to make it feel almost right. But ultimately, they don't feel quite right. And five is absolutely the best player count to play Battlestar with. And Battlestar is the game, if I have five players, I'll most likely want to play. So thank you for taking the time to check out our list. These longer form videos are made possible by my supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to get in on these videos, come along and sign up. If you've got any suggestions for games that are great at five players, leave them in the comments below. And if you've got any games I didn't mention that you think I should be playing with five players, also mention them in the comments below. And if you enjoy this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and support us on Patreon.